Hello, I'm Kristen Lang, Senior Program Director of the Series Company Network and lead author of the Series Roadmap 2030. I want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us today for the virtual launch of this 10-year action plan for sustainable business leadership. In the early days of 2020, I sat like many of you in reflection of what had transpired over the last decade. So many events, both positive and negative, served to shape the current state of our economy, our planet, and our social fabric. It was a decade that saw Alaskan glaciers melting 100 times faster than previously predicted. It introduced the previously unfathomable idea that entire cities could run dry, facing day zero and the worst mega drought in the US in 1200 years. It brought the number of men, women, and children caught in the clutches of modern slavery to more than 40 million worldwide. It laid bare the experience of women across the globe as colleagues, friends, and family members stepped forward with the courage to say, me too. It was also the decade that saw thousands of companies and investors declare, we are still in the Paris Agreement. And after years of making the business case that climate change is a systemic financial risk, the largest asset owners and asset managers in the world, with 47 trillion under management, stepped forward to agree. This decade saw sustainably directed assets under management triple to more than 40 trillion globally now representing one of every $4 invested. It was in those first few weeks of 2020 that I sat in reflection, not knowing that the months to come would eclipse every experience of the past 10 years, testing us as individuals, communities, colleagues, business leaders, nations, and as a human race in ways we could not even imagine. The pandemic has left millions without work, only to rely upon failing social safety nets. The climate crisis worsened, Wildfires from Australia to the northwestern U.S. burned at rates among the most destructive ever seen. And the killings of Black Americans further ignited a nationwide movement here in the U.S. calling for an end to systemic racism. The idea of building a more equitable, just, and sustainable economy shifted from an ideal to an imperative. And it has also inspired more action. Whereas at the end of 2019, only a handful of the largest companies in the U.S. had targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the latest science, in the last few months, we've seen the number of net zero commitments rise to more than 1,500 worldwide. Commitments are necessary. Yes, they put a proverbial line in the sand, creating accountability. And if taken seriously, they can unleash innovation but without appropriate resources, without changes to the way the companies govern themselves, design future strategy and determine business priorities, they will fall far short of what is needed. And without the right policies and capital market systems in place to enable wholesale action, we will not be able to avoid the worst impacts of these global sustainability threats. So what will it take for us to build a more equitable, just and sustainable future? What will it take to move corporate commitments from words to results to industry-wide action? The series Roadmap 2030 is a vision for sustainable business leadership and a 10-year action plan to help companies strategically navigate this new and rapidly changing business reality, helping them not just to survive, but to thrive. The series Roadmap calls on companies to not only embed sustainability in how they do business, but to redefine the role of the corporation as advocates for changing the very institutions that shape corporate decision-making. It outlines the specific actions needed this decade to stabilize the climate, protect water and natural resources, and build a just and inclusive economy. Laying out what those milestones look like from today to 2025 and on to 2030. Today's fireside chat between Mindy Luber, series CEO and president, and James Quincy, Chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company will explore these action steps and how the leaders of the largest companies in the world can put them into motion. But before we turn to Minnie and James, we are pleased to share with you first a short video. We reached out to leading corporate executives, investors, and sustainability advocates to give their thoughts on the question that the series Roadmap 2030 is designed to answer. What does sustainable business leadership look like in the decade ahead? I believe sustainable leadership is about taking responsibility and being intentional about our role in the community. This past week, National Grid took a big step forward with the launch of our Responsible Business Charter for the first time ever. In it, 
we have said to the world loudly and clearly that we are about more than making money. For us, that's about playing a leadership role in the transition to a cleaner world and reducing the emissions not only from our own operations to net zero, but also the emissions from the electricity and gas we sell to our customers. It's about ensuring that as we do that, no one is left behind. So a just and inclusive transition. Corporate sustainability is not going to look anything like it did in the past. Instead of trying to embed sustainability into corporations, we need to embed business and corporations into sustainability. There's no other way. Uh, resources are finite. You know, all the trends that I've spent 30 years working on are going in the wrong direction. It's still important for companies to be reporting and measuring greenhouse gas emissions and setting science-based targets. It's also equally important that they're reporting on their actions to lobby governments, not for their vested interests, but actually for the, the greater public good. Because we recognize that companies can actually achieve sustainability on their own. We need regulators and governments to actually set rules and put a price on these massive externalities that are just missing from the profit and loss statement today. Sustainable leadership is about steadily pursuing courses of action that build over time to serve stakeholders. It's about doing, not talking. And this requires putting your stakeholders at the forefront of all a company does. And for us, we think very comprehensively about stakeholders. So it's customers, consumers, employees, the agency force, opinion leaders, policymakers, and our investors. And by doing those things, we feel by focusing on our stakeholders, we will have sustainable leadership at our company. Sustainable business leadership is leadership that builds resilience for the environment, for society, and for the business. We're striving to do this by advancing our work with suppliers and farmers to build greater natural resource resilience, with food security partners like Feeding America and FairShare to build resilience amongst the most at-risk populations, and working in our own operations to make manufacturing more resilient to the ebbs and flows of consumer demands. We are treating the world with care by helping to regenerate the planet's natural resources. Threats to natural resource impact our business and our ability to feed a growing global population. To drive growth and resilience, we need to move beyond sustaining our planet and towards regenerating it. Sustainability efforts in the coming decade must step up to a new level of commitment to reach the rapid decarbonization targets science tells us are necessary. We've seen corporate leadership, amazing leadership on investment, on voluntary action in their operations, in their supply chains. Now we need to see companies take their climate concern into the policy arena to make change at the scale that will address the magnitude of this problem. We need to see new momentum behind pro-climate policy and corporate engagement can be a real game changer. 2020 needs to be the kickoff of a new decade of climate commitment and Sirius has, has provided a great roadmap for this. Companies are really going to need to step up, act boldly, act swiftly, to demonstrate how they're integrating sustainability into their business practices. We need to see how they're managing their climate impacts, their human capital risks, in a way that is just part and parcel of their DNA so that we as investors can accurately assess and value the steps they're taking. You know, at this moment in time where we're all grappling with persistent and pervasive racial inequality um, on top of the gender equality that, you know, people have been working on, you know, for decades now, you know, we're really needing to see that companies do more than just state their commitment. We're really looking to see action now. So for us, that is looking to see that companies have an actual understanding of what workforce composition looks like for them, what steps they are going to take to get from where they are now to where they need to be, and a really candid discussion on where those challenges are, where those barriers are, and the role that they have as an employer in helping address them both within the companies, but also in larger society. This is the most momentous decade in human history. We have the choice to build a world that works for everyone, as Buckminster Fuller called on us to do, or to usher in the collapse of humanity. Problems like climate change, like the loss of biodiversity, inequality are existential crises. They could end life as we know it on this planet. 
and we have all of the tools we need to create a world of flourishing, a world of thriving, a world that works for everyone. The Ceres Roadmap is such an important step in this direction. Ceres has always been the leader in the business community in showing us the direction that business needs to go in. Business remains the only institution on the planet that is big enough, well enough managed, resourceful enough to tackle the problems facing us. Fabulous start. That was um, terrific. Uh, Kristen, thank you for all of your work to get us to this point. Thanks to your team, the superb team, you've built a strong, bold action plan to follow this decade that will put us on the right path. And to our partners who just offered commentary, um, thank you for sharing with us not only your perspective, but your sense of urgency for acting now, if not sooner. I am Mindy Luber, Series CEO and President. I'm delighted to be joined today by James Quincy, of the, cha the Chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola. Thank you, James. Thanks for being with us today to share your perspective and for your actions and what you've done. I'm excited to hear from you, to look at and listen to somebody who is putting at words into action and making things happen. Uh, there's a sustainability journey going on at Coke. We're eager to hear that. We have a lot to talk about in a very short period of time. Uh, so let us jump right in. Let me start with the question about the role of the corporation. James, tell me your view. How do you view your role as CEO in achieving a more equitable, a more just and sustainable economy? The pandemic that we're living through and the calls to end systemic racism and the wildfires burning across the Western United States. These first six months of 2020 have put into sharp focus the business imperative to embrace a sustainable business strategy. We do not solve these problems without business leadership. As a leader of one of the most iconic companies in the world, how have you seen the role of the CEO change in recent years? And from where you sit, what does sustainable business leadership look like in the decade to come? Well, um, thank you, Mindy. Um, so let, let me jump straight in. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking, letting me have this opportunity uh, um, to discuss this with you and talk about the, the series roadmap to 2030. Um, you know, as I think about that, the question and the document, what I, firstly, what I really like about it is it, it, it combines both the what's and the how's. The what we need to do to help stabilize the climate, protect the water and the natural resources, and also to build uh, a more just and inclusive economy, and the how, how we need to do it. The business practices and the routines required for companies big and small uh, to get things done. So for me, embracing a sustainable business strategy is about taking a long-term approach. Uh, clearly, we need to act now, uh, thinking about the next quarter century, not just the next quarter. Of course, also a lot has changed in a way over the last six months, but we need to keep looking forward over the long term. We need to remain committed to our long term sustainability goals. Far from the Coca Cola company's perspective, you know, um, as we went back in and when the pandemic hit and we looked at all the previous crises that have hit our company over the last 134 years, whether they be military, uh, environmental, economic, or pandemic. One of the important features uh, we consider is this, by the time the world gets back to pre-crisis state, so to speak, by the time the economy is back to 2019 levels, have we made a step forward as a company? Do we have better business fundamentals, better sustainability outcomes, better engagement with our stakeholders and organizations? And that's the North Star uh, that we set. We, we have to, keep the long term in mind and embrace the fact that the disruption of the crisis can help us get better. We, we fundamentally believe that we can emerge stronger uh, as a more sustainable business through these challenges. And as the roadmap says, the decade ahead, more than any other, 
represents a turning point in our history. Uh, there is no time to waste. And um, if I think about the recent changes in recent years and uh, breaking it down further in terms of in embedding sustainability into our strategy, there are, there are three things that come to mind about the role of the CEO and how that's changed in approaching this, or, or at least how, I, how I've approached it. Um, the first is, is continuous learning. You know, in each part of the world we operate in, we gather learnings, we reflect on successes or challenges that we have in, in order to be able to continue forward. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, it's that mindset uh, of continuous learning that's critical, um, whether it's at my level or any other levels of the organization, um, because we have, to, we have to recognize we don't have all the answers to the questions. Uh, so we've got to seek out information, research, analysis, uh, seek to engage the experts, uh, like those in series, uh, and many of you on the call today. Secondly, the company, we have to leverage our global scale in order to bring a strategy to life, in order to be able to do justice to our business, our employees, the community, the environment we operate in and serve. Leaders need to drive a, a networked organization that allows and is capable of experimenting, capable of connecting to the local opportunity, and capable of sharing those learning, learnings and driving scale uh, on the biggest opportunities, regional or global. And third, um, embedding sustainability. Uh, the third is to drive the vision where sustainable, sustainability, the execution and the metrics are embedded in the business processes. It can't stand on the side. So that every market around the re world reports their actions uh, in line with our goals. They're measured and they're rewarded on their progress and our sustainability goals are embedded because we know bolt-ons rarely stand the test of time. And just um, thinking forward on the next 10 years uh, and thinking about the future, let's uh, think back for a moment. Today being uh, October the 7th, um, it's also the same day the writer Toni Morrison became the first black woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, uh, October the 7th, 1993. It's also the birthday of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He was born on October the 7th, 1931, uh, and in 1984 received the Nobel Peace Prize for his opposition to apartheid in South Africa. On this day, with such milestones to commemorate, uh, I wanted to talk for a few moments about the future of the racial equality movement here in the US and around the world. Companies like ours must speak up of allies to the Black Lives Movement. We stand with those seeking justice and equality. And frankly, America has not made enough progress. And corporate America has not made enough progress, <clears throat> nor honestly has the Coca-Cola company. And so as a nation, as individuals, we must do better. And businesses like ours can play an important role. Uh, and as a company that believes diversity and inclusion are among our greatest strengths, we're putting in place resources and energy towards helping end the cycle of systemic racism. Of course, we don't have all the answers, but I believe that we, together with civic and community advocates, government officials, fellow business leaders, our partners, and with the views and voices of those who challenge injustice, we can find solutions. And we're focusing our efforts on four main areas, listening, leading, investing, and advocating. For example, in investing, we'll spend an additional 500 million with black owned businesses over the next five years. This will more than double the com company's current spend as it relates to black owned businesses, which we hope will provide black entrepreneurs and innovators with opportunities for growth and economic empowerment. On our advocating, we'll work through our business network to support change and embrace policies that matter. For example, we public publicly supported legislation to advance the hate crimes bill in Georgia, which was recently signed into law. The company will continue to support collective actions and pledges across the business community. I believe we need to move faster on racial equality. Uh, in the past, frankly, we've been too slow and my determination uh, is to do better going forward. Uh, James, you're catching me off guard at how profoundly valuable that comment was. Uh, I will quickly go back to, um, our questions that we've talked about, but that voice, that message on addressing structural racism and the role of the corporation, 
your note about two of our great leaders, um, Desmond Tutu and Toni Morrison. Um, what a wonderful message. And, and so clear that sustainability is not just about the environment, it is about the broader role of the corporation, the broader ESG issues, and that they not be side issues. They are part of who you are and who you will be as a corporation. Um, so uh, my heartfelt thanks. I, I don't know that I've heard it said better. I cannot urge you or support you enough in the importance of the corporation taking on these challenges. Um, and your words were beautiful on race issues and where you're going. So uh, good luck with everything, but on that piece of the work, uh, we all need to stand with you and get behind you. Going back to, you know, climate as one of our grave world's challenges, part of your strategy is engaging and building a circular economy, something we call for in the series roadmap. How did COPE drive forward this strategy and did it get slowed down or is it full speed ahead during the pandemic? What are the barriers to realizing a circular business model and what are you doing to address this? Because if you could do it and show it's doable and a half a dozen or several dozen others, we build it out then. It becomes the standard practice and not just the practice that only certain leaders consider. Um, sure, and thank, thank you for those words on, 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 on what we're trying to do on, on the racial issues. Um, climate, I mean, uh, climate change is, uh, as, as we all know, a very profound challenge. Uh, we are partnering with other businesses, um, civil society, governments, to really support co cooperative action on this critical issue. And, and we're acting, as you say, on our own operations and supply chain. Um, in 2013, we set a goal to reduce our carbon footprint uh, of the drink in your hand by 25% by 2020 uh, across our entire value chain. And, and at the time it was industry leading uh, and we certainly are on track to achieve that goal by the end of this year. But we recognize there is still much more to do, uh, which is why we've set a 2030 uh, goal, a science-based target to reduce our total carbon emissions by 25% uh, uh, covering the full value chain, scopes one, two, and three for the, those that love the technical detail. And the 25% isn't random or arbitrary. It's the share of carbon we need to reduce as a company to align with the Paris Agreement. Um, and so as we think about the circular economy uh, and what's necessary and how that those two meet, meet together with, with our goal on, on carbon reduction, it, it's, I mean, the circular economy is absolutely essential to us for achieving our climate goals because packaging is almost one third of our overall carbon footprint. So these goals are interconnected. So globally, uh, the Coca-Cola company, ha we have a strategy called World Without Waste, through which we aim to collect, collect a bottle or can for everyone we sell, uh, of course, make sure our, all our packaging is fully recyclable and use the packaging, con the recycled content back in our packaging. And through this World Without Waste initiative, uh, for example, by, by developing advanced plant-based packaging that requires less oil, by investing um, in local recycling programs that collect old bottles so they become new ones, we are lowering our carbon footprint one package at a time. As research um, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, has noted, only 55% of carbon emissions can be addressed by, trans, uh, by transitioning to renewable energy uh, and greater energy efficiency. The other 45% must come from rethinking the way we make everyday products, whether they be cars or clothes or food, and yes, of course, beverages. Um, and, and that's super important to, to have both those things in mind. Another aspect, uh, when we think about the circular economy, particularly again, as it relates to packaging, uh, is that there are different types of plastics. Some plastics have high value and are easily made uh, part of the circular economy. Um, and some are very hard to recycle and have little value in the recycling stream. High value plastics uh, like PET bottles are, are the, pre that PET bottle is the preeminent high value plastic ultimately in the recycling stream. If you can get them back, they're fully recyclable and fully reusable uh, in, in more beverage bottles again. So for example, 
Um, we, have, we have beverage options where we have 100% uh, recycled plastic in 18 markets around the world. Uh, and this number is growing even during the pandemic. Uh, markets like uh, Australia, Austria, Philippines, Peru, South Africa, Switzerland. Uh, so high value plastics can certainly uh, be driven to do much better. Now, as it relates to the low value plastics, the plastic, for example, that wraps and holds the bottles together uh, is an example of a plastic that's much harder to recycle and, and, and hence has low value. And so we're looking to replace it, uh, for example, with paper or card wrapping. Uh, for a, a few months ago, uh, in August this year, a uh, European bottling operation, Coca-Cola European Partners, started rolling out a paper ba paperboard-based ring technology for all the multi-packs of cans. Um, the Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling Company started rolling out similar technology at the end of 2019. And all of this has been, has been uh, continued and driven forward uh, despite uh, all the issues to do with the pandemic. Uh, and then there are plastics in the middle. They're not high value, they're not low value. Um, uh, and here, we think that innovation is critical because this type of plastic uh, requires new technology and new approaches. For example, uh, just last month, our Dasani uh, brand in the US launched bottle caps made with recycled plastic. And this is a beverage industry first. Uh, in fact, it, the development won an innovation award for being the first beverage closer, closure made uh, from post-consumer recycled content. So in summary, we are valuing and recycling high value plastics. We're turning them into new bottles. We're replacing hard to recycle low value plastics and we're innovating in that middle space with new technologies to, to give value to those plastics in the middle. Um, but of course, we, we need partnerships to get this done, especially um, as you mentioned in the pandemic. Um, and so we've been forging ahead with our strategies on the circular economy with our partners, even in the pandemic. So for example, um, in recycling in March this year, uh, the Philippine, our, our beverage operation in the Philippines signed a partnership with uh, Indorama uh, to establish Pet Value, the largest bottle to bottle recycling facility in the country. It'll be able to process 2 billion plastic bottles per year. We're also focused on financing innovation. Together with industry colleagues like Danone, PepsiCo, Unilever, et cetera, we were inaugural investors in Circulate Capital, uh, a firm dedicated uh, to financing solutions, solutions that prevent plastic entering the ocean. Uh, the fund raised $100 million uh, and announced their first two investments in April this year, uh, epicenter of the, the pandemic. One supporting a company in India, uh, that turns difficult to manage flexible plastics into high quality reusable plastic granules. And another um, supporting a female led company in Indonesia specializing in recycling plastic bottles into flakes, uh, which are then used to manufacture other types of packaging and textiles. So through the pandemic, we know that people uh, have remained committed uh, to sustainable packaging options. And research shows that the new containers are made from uh, virgin materials are the least likely choice for consumers post pandemic. So partnerships, partnerships across business, government and civil society will be critical to us reaching our circular economy and climate targets. We remain committed to engaging proactively to drive collection and to drive action across this. Impressive and terrific. And as you say, none of this happens one company alone. The fact that Coke is doing impressive work, uh, but the fact that you're looking at partnerships and bringing others along, and there are certain issues that defy competitiveness. Of course, it was Coke, there's Pepsi, uh, but working together, uh, it is actually heartening on the technology side, the investment side, to see the kind of change and to see your movement. Uh, thank you. Uh, moving from climate to water, and I for no seconds want to suggest these things are truly separable. They are all part of the same problem. But the climate crisis is clear, as is the water crisis. We've got scarcity and we've got pollution problems, and they are depleting our most precious natural resource. Water, it is the key ingredient of your business of our life, of communities, of women who are having to feed their families. 
Over the years, it has been a specific area of attention for you, and I understand that will only increase. What are you thinking about? What are you doing to ramp up efforts across Coca-Cola and the industry to protect this life-changing critical resource? And how do we elevate the issue of water risk in the private sector, as we've done with climate risk? to get it the attention it absolutely deserves and demands. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I mean, water self-evidently is central uh, to our products and supply chain as it is to, to people in the environment. And it's a highly related issue to climate change, although it needs its own focus. Um, and, and as you say, as the world's largest beverage company, we really do take our responsibility on water very seriously. Um, so let me let me talk about water uh, in in three areas of leadership and learning: uh, water replenishment, plant efficiency, and community uh, access to water. Uh, and this is the these three areas are where we have focused our intention uh, our, our attention in line with the series roadmap uh, goals of protecting the ecosystems, um, reducing water use, and and ensuring uh, water quality for communities. So uh, water replenishment. Uh, in 2007, we set ourselves a goal to return to communities and nature 100% of the water we use to manufacture our products uh, and their production globally by 2020. At the time, we did not have all the answers on how we would achieve this, uh, but we worked to develop a methodology with great partners uh, along the way. And since 2015, uh, five years ahead of schedule, we achieved that goal. We replenish more than 100% of the water we use every year since 2015. Uh, and in 2019, this figure was 160%. So we've returned uh, 1.5 trillion liters of fresh water back to the environment and community since 2012. Uh, so absolutely, water replenishment is doable. Um, in terms of plan operations, we continue to work within our operations to improve water efficiency and I've seen an 18% improvement in water efficiency since, 2020, uh, since 2010. Um, and we have more to do, uh, and we will continue to drive efficiency in our own operations. And community water access. This is an extremely important component uh, of our action plan, uh, and is helping to provide water and sanitation uh, for families and households in poor and vulnerable parts of the world. Um, we've reached 10.6 million people uh, through our water, sanitation, and hygiene uh, programs since 2010. And our Replenish Africa initiative, uh, which began in 20, 2009, has reached 5 million people in 41 countries across Africa. And during the pandemic, we increased uh, our programs, our actions in many countries. Uh, for example, Uganda, where Coca-Cola Beverages Africa supported by the Ministry of Health, uh, we're there to distribute 5,000 hand-washing sanitation stations uh, in public high-risk areas as a way of protecting people against the spread of COVID-19. And as we think about the actions through the pandemic, you know, of course, uh, COVID has thrown into stark relief the importance of action on water. We remain laser focused on our goals. Uh, and I note uh, that among our partners, there really is uh, a strong sense of collective interest and urgency. Uh, there are several key initiatives that have been uh, started in recent months, uh, which we are a part of. Uh, one, uh, the Water Resilience Coalition uh, launched in March. Uh, the Water Resilience Coalition is a CEO-led initiative committed to reducing water stress uh, by 2050. Uh, and concretely, this forum will allow companies to coordinate activity on a basin uh, by basin basis so we can scale our collective impacts uh, uh, where it's relevant for, for our businesses. Uh, Wash for Work, this was launched in July. Wash for Work uh, is a public private initiative with other partners, including uh, the Global Poverty Project and UNICEF aimed at addressing water, sanitation, and hygiene challenges in the workplace. The private sector creates nine out of 10 jobs in developing countries. As such, businesses are in a unique position to impact billions of people every day, including, including those that work in our factories, the farms, the stores, and the offices. WaterAid, uh, in September, 
Uh, we were pleased to join a campaign with WaterAid, uh, the Water Resilience Coalition, the UN Global Compact, and other partners, including Cargill, uh, Diageo, and Heineken, to propel access to clean water to the top of the corporate agenda for post-COVID recovery. Through this campaign, we specifically call out the importance of hand washing and hygiene as the first line of defense against pandemic and other infectious diseases. And the last example, Business for Nature. Also in September, the Business for Nature collaboration platform launched the Call to Action for Nature, which we are a part of. It brings together uh, major organizations, corporations, including Walmart, Unilever, the World Economic Forum, and the WWF to call for greater action to protect nature. The call to action comes at a time as figures show that 84% of freshwater species have disappeared since the 1970s and an estimated $44 trillion uh, of global economic value is dependent on their uh, nature. So within the last six months alone, we have collaborated with partners in government, business and civil society to join these four distinct movements aimed at advocacy and action uh, in differing parts of the world, all for the end cause of water. Mindy, over to you. Great, thanks. Um, extremely impressive. If, if that isn't an example of what Janet Ranganathan from World Resources Institute said in one of the little cameo videos, it is no longer about integrating sustainability into corporations, corporations, uh, need to fully see sustainability as part of everything that they do. It's really impossible to imagine building out an economy where we don't have enough water. And as um, the World Economic Forum continues to tell us, we'll be 30% short of the water we need in a mere five years. So what you're talking about not only runs to small things like the future of humanity and having the ability to have this most precious resource but no company, almost no company I could imagine, can move forward without access to water. So how we price it, how do we preserve it, how do we keep it safe and pure um, is a challenge for the times and delighted to see the kind of leadership you're taking. Um, going back a bit to an inclusive economy, and you certainly talked about it beautifully as I noted, um, to remain resilient and competitive, all companies must ensure that they are diverse and inclusive, and they must be responsible and responsive in this time of rapid transformation, such as during COVID and during the social justice movement addressing racism. You talked a lot about the imperative of acting now uh, and the imperative of making a change and not waiting, and we could not be more supportive of that. What kind of action should companies be taking internally as it relates to their board, their staff, some of the mechanics, and I'd argue they're more than mechanics, but the changes that need to happen to build internally that just and inclusive economy that you're talking about and so supportive of? Uh, yeah, I mean, coming, coming back on the, the, as you say, on back on the question of the, the, the social and, 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 and the racial issues. Um, you know, this conversation, discussions around diversity, uh, inclusion um, and responsiveness in times of rapid transformation uh, as COVID uh, wouldn't uh, be complete, um, I think, unless we kind of dive a little deeper. And I'll talk a little more about what we're doing on the angle uh, of women's economic empowerment. Um, the UN had noted that with the spread of COVID-19, even uh, the somewhat limited gains made in the past decades on gender equality are at risk of being rolled back. Um, the pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities, exposing vulnerabilities in social, uh, political uh, and economic uh, systems, which in turn ultimately are going to uh, amplify the impact of, of the pandemic. So, when we look uh, externally and internally, we're working to empower women in the community and in our workforce. A uh, couple of examples. Uh, externally, we, we have a program that's been running called 5 by 20. And here our goal is to empower 5 million uh, female entrepreneurs across our global value chain by 2020. Uh, we, we have our data um, uh, looked at by Ernst & Young and we're on track to reach this, that goal uh, this year. As of 
2019, we uh, had 4.6 million uh, women being powered through this program, delivered across 96 countries around the world. Um, and the activities range from uh, right across the board. I mean, for example, in Poland, in 2019, there were 290,000 women uh, trained in a program called Success Is Me, which aimed to build self-esteem and strengthening business skills. All the way, things like Kenya from 2010, 2010, We've had a partnership with a Women uh, Enterprise Fund, providing 700,000 entrepreneurs with business skills and training and loans for bi business expansion um, in Kenya. Turning, turning internally, providing women with equal opportunity at the Coca-Cola Company is absolutely a key priority for us. Uh, it ensures the way we think and act as a business reflects the context in which we operate. We have work to do in some areas, but we have made good progress in some others. For example, the Coca-Cola company was recently ranked number five out of 300 uh, in the Forbes 2020 list of America's best employers for women. We have an aspiration to be 50% led by women uh, and have signed several uh, global and national gender equality pledges. These pledges underscore our company's goal to make sure women are represented at all levels of our company. I mean, today, approximately 47% of our global workforce is women. Over one third, 38% of our board directors are women uh, um, uh, and of interest. Um, in 1934, a woman uh, called uh, Letty Pate Whitehead was actually the first female to serve on the board of a major corporation in the US. Uh, and it was actually the Coca-Cola company board that she joined on which she served for uh, about 20 years. Uh, another example, last month, along with 30 other companies, we agreed to new disclosures of previously private uh, race, gender and ethnicity workforce data, which I think, you know, doubling down on increasing transparency. But we know there is more to do and we remain committed to gender equality and empowerment acting both externally in the community and internally in our own workplace. Uh, and as the roadmap says, to remain resilient and competitive in the decade ahead, companies must take a hard look at the human impacts of business decision-making across all levels of the organization and find ways to positively influence the institutions that allow inequality to persist. Back to you, Mindy. Great, no, thank you. And that is indeed impressive. And we'll look forward to the goals being executed and implemented and the forward looking thoughts that you provided on how to do the same and set those goals with people of color. Um, your efforts are, are out there as a leadership. I'm sure as number three, you're gonna to get to number one in no time whatsoever. Uh, let me ask a question about truly the how, not only the what. Our roadmap not only challenges companies to take more ambitious action, it also maps out ways in which companies could improve corporate governance, strategic planning, and disclosure. We've got to stop separating these things where we've got a sustainability department on one side of the house, but legal departments and financial departments and strategic planning departments are not fully integrated. So it is not just about what you're doing, it's about how it becomes part of your business routines to effectively redefine the understanding of business as usual. How does that happen at Coke? What are the key changes you've made as chairman and CEO? And what steps are you taking to ensure these changes are sustained, embedded in the company's culture, and will exist for the long term? Sure. Um... I mean, uh, Coca-Cola has a pretty strong track record with regards to governance, planning, uh, and disclosure principles that aim to manage business risk, drive business performance, um, of course, build that corporate reputation, uh, and engage with current and future employees. And from my perspective, I'm always looking uh, to ensure we evolve. That we are, that we're aligned uh, or leading best practice, that we're pushing ourselves to develop and to progress. Um, being uh, an enthusiastic skier, although grounded for who knows how long due to the pandemic, um, 
I suppose I, I like to see it, uh, some of these things uh, as the way I like to approach my skiing, where uh, ultimately in skiing, it, it pays to lean forward and lean into things. Uh, and if you lean back, it tends to go badly wrong. So if you just start from that perspective, uh, uh, then, you know, it's kind of, that's the approach we take uh, in many areas, including this. And, and just to connect to some pieces of the series roadmap on this, um, on corporate purpose, Late last year, we worked um, to more clearly define and transparently outline our company purpose, which to remind everyone is to refresh the world and make a difference. I will say that at the outset, uh, it took me some time to evolve my own thinking here. It needed ultimately to be personal for me. It couldn't be something that I looked at and didn't feel connected to. Um, so together with our leadership team, we took quite a number of months and poured over each and every word. Um, it, it, it has to feel like it's written by the CEO um, and crafted by the leadership team and not some disembodied committee. Uh, so the vision we have is to, is to craft the brands and the choice of drinks that people love, to refresh them uh, in body and spirit, and to do it in ways that create a more sustainable business and a better shared future that makes a difference in people's lives, communities, and planet. This is not about better outcomes just for the business. It's about defining our business by truly creating stakeholder value and having a positive impact. It guides all the actions we take. Second um, example, um, back to the roadmap, would be on board oversight. Our board, um, has for a very long time predating me, uh, has understood that they have a very important role in sustainability. And, and they take that role very seriously. Uh, as chairman, one of my priorities, of course, is to ensure that the board's processes and, and structures remain effective to help us meet our objectives. Uh, and to that end, earlier this year, we instituted an important change regarding our board committee structure uh, whereby the Public Policy and Sustainability Committee is now primarily focused on the board's oversight, the company's core sustainability and public policy work. Third area of example, uh, last example, uh, data and disclosure. Uh, data and disclosure is, is critical for the Coca-Cola company because we're so in the public eye. Uh, and over the last uh, two years, we've combined our business and sustainability reviews into one integrated annual business and sustainability report. We index the contents of the report to several important reporting frameworks and standards. Uh, and I believe business has made good strides in collecting data and reporting transparency on goals. It's now uh, the right time to establish a broad understanding of ESG metrics to declutter the noise and collectively recognize how these actions really do help shape a more sustainable and resilient future. And looking forward, uh, the world faces myriads of challenges um, and so does every business and every community. Uh, and this makes it paramount that we, we, we have clear what we stand for uh, and how we're gonna you know, really focus uh, on leaving a footprint behind uh, that makes sense for the future and, and that we execute uh, with the right governance, uh, planning, and disclosure measures in place. Um, so I uh, hope that helped back over to you, Mindy. No, that was great. And, and you talked about the component parts. We all know that without great leadership, um, things don't happen. And without board guidance articulating the key priorities for the corporation, things don't happen. And without systemic integration, things don't get executed. And without transparency, Nobody knows what's going on. So the fact that you touched on each of those things uh, and the leadership work that you're doing, and there's always more to do, and you were the first to say that, um, those are some great models that we hope many others will look at. But it does require systematizing sustainability, integrating it like any other challenge that a large multinational company faces. Uh, so great examples, and thank you. You're doing a lot alone. And you're doing a lot in partnership and collaborations, and you were very specific about that. That's great. Companies can't, in the end, they could run their companies alone. We're all driven by some competitive nature. But we can't 
possibly see the change that we need without collaborations of companies, of mayors, of policymakers, of NGOs, uh, because it will take all of us to get it done. It will also take regulatory and policy changes. They may differ from state to state, country to country. We're in a global community where we all need to be aligned. Certainly something like climate change is about aligning around the Paris Agreement, which we so strongly endorse as the North Star. Um, how do companies start engaging in the political process in a way that's consistent with their sustainability goals. That's not to say that the world's largest companies don't have huge government relations teams that know what they're doing. They are out front on everything from trade risk, currency risk, inflation risk, and dozens of other things that are essential to the company. We still see an enormous disconnect between companies who are trying to lead internally but who are still supporting trade associations that oppose climate policy or human rights policies or water policies. How do we move forward in the next five years to have more consistency? Because we know we're gonna need a level playing field. We're gonna need some policies. They've gotta be the right policies and not foolish ones, um, but policies that require all of us to play by the same set of rules, as does the Paris Agreement in some broad way. Um, how do we get closer to that alignment? And, and are we getting closer? Um, I mean, firstly, certainly uh, companies have a, a very important role to play in creating uh, systems level change um, to realize a more just and, and, and sustainable economy. I mean, Coca-Cola, we, we operate in uh, over 200 countries and territories. And as a system, we have over 225 bottling partners around the world that adds up to 900 bottling factories um, employing over 700,000 people and serving 30 million retail customer outlets so we we believe it's part uh, of our dna that we must work together by forming meaningful partnerships that create shared opportunities for communities and people around the world and, and hopefully uh, in some of my other answers, I've outlined, as you said, some of the specific ways we engage in public policy advocacy, um, in multi-stakeholder collaboration, um, particularly for us, at least in the areas of packaging, climate, uh, water, and racial equality. Uh, and, and ultimately, we must uh, and will continue this path. This is the biggest opportunity, I say. This is the biggest challenge if we don't get it right. If the pandemic uh, has taught us anything, it is that we cannot act alone, that we really are in this together. Um, recently, uh, the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, President of Ghana, uh, said something very simple. We've all gone down together. We should all rise together. Um, this, this crisis has shone a light on the interconnected nature of our world, has demonstrated the need for deep systemic change and has revealed that often the best solutions lie in local in-country capacity and knowledge with the appropriate level of global sharing. So after this, the, the initial shock of COVID-19 has passed, the lessons we must learn must be applied to help us emerge stronger. The realization that we must be able to get to a more sustainable, more inclusive economic future. I, moving forward, I am, I remain optimistic as we embark on this path over the next 10 years to craft and meet our goals uh, for 2030. The, uh, the roadmap and these conversations, these discussions today will play an important guiding role. Um, so hopefully uh, that th those have helped. James, that's a great note uh, to end on. Hope is what drives us. We've got challenges well beyond anything we might have been able to imagine, uh, but we need ingenuity and technology and leadership and resources and capital, a sense of community, and we need hope. And your final words uh, were as hopeful as any, and I too agree there's room for optimism if we work together, if we set audacious goals, if we're consistent, and if we move at a pace and a scale unlike anything we've done. Uh, you've given us a good deal of time and some truly insightful thoughts. Thank you, James. I wish you 
the best of luck for achieving your goals with the company and broader. Uh, they're audacious, they're ambitious, uh, and that's what we need in today's world. And to all of those who have tuned in to today's discussion, thank you for joining us. We will send out uh, an email with a recording of this session shortly. And remember to go to series.org to check out the new Series Roadmap 2030. It's been a delight to talk with you all. We'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Be safe and be well. Take care, folks.